started here with Samantha, who's the Instructional Technology Coordinator from Jacksonville North Pulaski School District in Arkansas. You know, Samantha, I spend my spare time dreaming about moving to Arkansas or any Midwestern state to get out of the tax structure of California. And <laughs> and I'm like, I poke around on Realtor.com and Zillow.com and just fantasize and, you know, it's kind of fun. So anyway, so good to have you today. I'm going to let you just let it rip. And if you want to take over the screen and kind of share with us about your topic of leading through the pandemic, that'd be great. Or we can just chat. Okay. I'll go ahead and take over the screen if that's all right. Okay, good. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Can you see my presentation and hear me? Yeah. Beautiful. Wonderful. Okay. Perfect. Well, it is so great to be here today. Um, I always love to come and join Leilani. She's such a sweetheart and it's always a really good discussion and I learn a ton. Um, so I was excited to join today and it was such a big, big topic that they gave me to talk about. <laughs> they said, go ahead and talk about leading through the pandemic. And they gave me a couple things to focus on um, in this big scope of what leading through the pandemic is. And so as I was making my presentation um, last night and this morning and thinking about all of the things um, that came up and, and all the things that I learned when we were leading through this pandemic in my district, I really decided that it was good to focus on sort of mistakes that we made and then things that we learned about our practice from those. So I'm gonna talk about mistakes that we made and things that we learned from those mistakes. And we'll sort of use that as a jumping off board to talk about best practices that we're employing now and that we're gonna to continue to use in the future. Okay. Um, that bit.ly will take you to this presentation. You don't have to join, but if you want to, it's bit.ly slash learning council, three, two, um, the L and the C are capitalized, okay? So if you want to go ahead and join in, you can. So I'm Samantha Duchere. I'm the Instructional Technology Coordinator for Jacksonville North Pulaski School District. Um, Jacksonville North Pulaski School District is a smaller school district outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. So we are about um, 25 minutes outside of the city proper. We're a pretty urban suburban um, suburb but we have about 4,500 students depending on the day. And we have about, um, right now we have seven schools. Next year we'll have six because as we improve our facilities, we're combining elementary schools, okay? You can find me sort of on all of the things at Tech for Y'all. So not Tech for All, Tech for Y'all with a Y. Um, I have the Gmail there. I have a website at techforyall.org. Um, and my Twitter is Tech for Y'all as well. Additionally, there's a link to my school district's website if you want to view that and just get to know a little bit more about our school district. Okay. So where do we start? I think it's important to start with the mistakes that we made. Um, we've all made a lot of mistakes over the past year, right? I mean, it's been a crazy, insane year, and we've just been trying to build the bike while we ride it. Um, and so when I think about this discussion of things that I learned, I feel like that's a very, very important piece of it because we learned them from the mistakes. Uh, the first thing that we learned um, is that simultaneous teaching, aka what we've been calling synchronous learning here, isn't really the best thing. Uh, it has been a hot button in a lot of southern states, especially in Arkansas, uh, to define synchronous learning as essentially I have a computer or a swivel or whatever piece of tech in the room, and I am teaching my lesson to the students in the room and to the students on the Zoom or the Meet, however you're doing it. So sort of synchronous, but also simultaneously trying to teach two groups. Uh, we definitely have a large portion of our students, like in our high school, um, I would say at least 50 to 75% of our students are under fifth grade reading level. And we just discovered that this was not successful for us. It was really asking our teachers to do far too many things at once. Um, it wasn't good for the teacher or the student most of the time. I think that some of our advanced student populations are fine with this structure, um, but for the majority of our students uh, who wouldn't be classified as advanced, maybe they would be classified as at risk, uh, it was not very effective. The teacher can't be engaged with two groups of kids at once, right? They're trying to move their engagement back and forth fluidly, which is almost impossible to do, especially if you have any sort of behavior in the room, which never happens, right? We never have behavior. 
Um, and one of the things that we found was our biggest issue was that when we pulled students and talked to students, the biggest thing that was a pain for them and that really disengaged them when they were virtual was that joining the virtual classroom, when they ask a student or put, ask a question or put something in the chat, it takes a while for the teacher to answer, right? If I'm up at the board, it takes me every five to 10 minutes to get back to actually go ahead and answer that question. And for our students, that really made them feel disengaged and it made them feel like they weren't being heard. So we had a very high proportion of our students actually leaving the Zoom calls when that would happen. Like they'd ask a question, they'd wait, they'd wait. Once you hit about five or seven minutes, the time for that question has passed. They probably don't understand the next concept that was introduced and they've left the call. Um, this kind of also to me resulted in a lot of our teachers getting back to Sage on the stage, which is what we've been trying to get away from for so long. So that was a big bummer for me as the instructional technology coordinator was like, oh, I've been teaching all of these teachers to be facilitators and so much around the United States, especially in the South where we're doing this synchronous plan, we're going back to the Sage on the stage plan, which isn't the best for anybody. So what do we do to make it better? Additionally, the other thing that I started to think about, especially when we pulled students and talked to the community, was, yes, it's super hard for our teachers, but the other issue is our students. You know, they're supposed to be glued to their computers in these live sessions all day long, and many of them are supposed to be glued to these computers all day long when there's no one at home to actually supervise them getting in the computers. Um, here in Arkansas, we offer virtual K through 12. That was a state requirement this year. So we had a certain amount of kids in the building, uh, but we had a large portion of our students were virtual for the whole year. And so K through 12, if you have third, fourth, fifth grade students trying to attend to these live meets during the day, it's a real struggle for these students. The other thing that I would consider a mistake is using the hot button term learning loss a lot. Um, I found that the more that we used it with our teachers, it sort of became something that was known in the community and students were hearing it. And our feedback from students were that they've lost a lot more in the pandemic. Like on their list, on their list, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, learning loss is not at the top. Like lots of our students have lost family members, they've lost friendships, they've lost the ability to socialize. That whole social emotional well being part of their lives is a mess. And so for them, and that doesn't even counter in actual loss of family and friends. So for them, us talking about learning loss as sort of this hot button term that's all over the place really kind of offended students when we actually got down and had a conversation with them about it. Because they were like, well, I've lost a lot more during this time um, and learning loss is not my biggest concern. My biggest concern is day-to-day -day stuff and making it through. So how do we reframe that? Because yes, we all know this is a concern, right? This is a big concern as admin and teachers, but how can we reframe it and maybe change that language so it's a little more acceptable and motivating for our students as well? Um, I don't typically show videos, but this is a super incredible video that I found um, when I was attending FETC. And it's a short film uh, by a student, and this was one of her um, school projects. And so this was her talking about how she felt in a normal day in the year of virtual learning. Okay. There's no words, it's all music, but let me know in the chat if you can't hear. You should be able to because I just shared a tab. Samantha, we're not hearing the music, but I think actually from my view, it's just as good silence. <laughs> it's
it's totally fine silent it's just music in the background yeah it's it's sad is what it is it is it's very sad but i think it's important that we see how they feel too And so just for me, this video has been a big thing because I've been trying to think about when we use words like learning loss and things like that, how, how are students interpreting that? Because for me, my whole thing is I'm always concerned about my teachers, right? And I'm an advocate for my teachers. And I think this is one of those times when we need to be advocates for our teachers, but we also always need to understand and advocate for the students. And I think sometimes we're forgetting about them a little bit. And so I love that video and I've been sharing it out whenever I can. Um, what an incredible student project too as well, right? Like I think the, I think when I read an article about it, it would, the prompt was just sort of give me a video essay of what student learn, like virtual learning is for you. So what an incredible way to let students share how they feel about virtual learning as well. Um, the other thing that's been a mistake, I think, is we've contributed to teacher burnout even if we didn't want to. And what do I mean by that? Um, as we have been frantically working in the central office all over the district to um, provide materials, provide resources, provide support, I think that we have also sort of provided stress in a way. Um, the biggest issue that I've found when just talking to teachers and talking to them about the things that have been stressing them out that have been causing them issues is the massive influx of emails that they get. Um, you know, I've, been, I've had many teachers tell me, yeah, it's really helpful all the stuff you're sending, but I've, I've received 300 emails a day while I'm trying to teach live, make lessons, and make asynchronous lesson videos. And so that's just a little too much for me. So I think thinking about how we might be contributing to teacher burnout, even when we're trying to help, and I think that was one of our major mistakes in the beginning of all of this. As far as best practices and what I think in the future is going to be helpful for us and what we've already started to implement here, we've reframed how we think about synchronous learning, at least in this district. Statewide, we're sort of still moving through this. Um, but we have moved from the idea of synchronous lessons to synchronous small group meetings. Um, so on an A-B schedule, that might look like, as a teacher in Ms. Duchere's class, I might record three lessons during the week. You might have three guided notes that you need to take during the week when you watch those lessons and turn those in. And then we're going to have two to three small group meetings. And in those small group meetings, we're going to do the work of teaching. So I may not even, I'm, I, I'm just going to facilitate. I'm going to have you guys 
each. I'm going to break up the time. If we have 45 minutes, I'll give them each seven minutes. And we're going to go through your body paragraph for your big essay project. We're going to go through your video essay, the first two minutes of it. Whatever it is we're working on, we're actually going to work on it together. So we can do that meat of teaching in our synchronous time. We're also going to start incorporating daily care and connect time. Um, attendance was a large issue for us this year. Um, attendance, and I think it's been an issue for everybody, but for us, it was a real issue. And so this year, in the beginning of the year, we had them filling out a form that they had to fill out every day um, because it seemed too strenuous for our teachers to be like as an assignment every day. They had to check and see who turned in the assignment, had that be attendance. So we were using a Google form that had to be turned in before midnight that counted as attendance. Next year, we're gonna do a daily care and connect time. So we're thinking somewhere around 9 to 9.30, um, our virtual students are going to have a mandatory meeting with one person every day for about 20 minutes. It's going to be a mandatory live meet when you're a virtual student. That counts as your attendance. And that also is going to sort of set, set the tone and start the day for our students, as well as being a daily social and emotional well-being check-in. Um, we're also going to try and view learning loss as an opportunity to like reframe our teaching style. Maybe less is more is where we're going to like more quality and less quantity is where we're going to move. Uh, but we're going to try to stop using the term all the time and instead use that as an opportunity to reframe how we're looking at the problem. We've really worked on giving teachers protected time. So this looks different all across the state in Arkansas. For us, we have virtual Monday, which is a protected time for teachers. Um, so there's no live meets. There is nothing going on on Mondays except for them catching up on what they need to catch up on. Some of the districts around here have that on Friday. And there are a couple districts that are smaller um, that actually have, don't have school on Friday. Friday is a catch up day for teachers and for students. Um, I think that the pivotal piece there is fighting to protect that time. And one of the biggest things that has become an admin responsibility is fighting to protect that time. Um, they need that time more than they've ever needed it. Also, as we move forward, we're trying to constantly ask our teachers what the solutions might be. And then we're trying to implement those. We're listening. Additionally, personally, I have made it my mission to have us all stop emailing after hours. So if we can schedule that send for tomorrow at 8 a.m., schedule that send. I think that right now, as far as our teacher's social and emotional well-being, um, work and their home life are intertwined in a way in which they've never been because you're always connected to your computer and the internet. And so I think the least that we can do is stop sending them emails after either four or five. Stop sending them emails, let them leave the building at the end of the day. They need to have some separation. And 95% of the time, if not 99.9, .9, that email can wait until tomorrow. I think the other thing, and this isn't very eloquent, but it's just learn from what you messed up. Like the whole theme of this presentation is we all were building the bike while we like wrote it. And so we made a lot of mistakes. We made them with the best of intentions. And sometimes it wasn't an all out mistake, but this is our opportunity to fail forward. And I think that this virtual learning and this pandemic has sort of opened a Pandora's box that is negative in a lot of ways, but also for us ed tech people who've always been pushing for how important an integral technology can be. There are some positives because we've been forced to sort of step our toes at least into the next generation of education. So that Pandora's box is open, you can't close it. Um, in Arkansas, we're gonna continue to offer um, a lot of these virtual opportunities. So we are offering limited spots K through 12 next year for virtual school. And then our educational co-ops, which service a whole county, so not a school district, but a whole county, they are offering a virtual school option as well. Um, so we're trying here to sort of meet the needs of the Pandora's box that we've opened. Last but definitely not least, sort of the foundation of everything is just don't forget that the backbone of everything right now is our teachers. I mean, they are, they are the backbone of everything that we're doing for students and they have done so much work for us. It's absolutely incredible. Um, a couple of weeks ago, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's linked on this page. An article came out that I really, really enjoyed. It's not a formal article at all. It's a post um, and it's called an incomplete yet heavily annotated list of things that don't help me as a teacher right now. <laughs> 
and it's by uh, Thomas Rodemaker. I'm probably pronouncing his last name wrong, uh, but he has some incredible posts. And I feel like this little graphic too is something that we have all felt this year. Like as you're drowning, someone high fives you and is like, thanks for what you do as a teacher and just kind of lets you keep going. Um, so I think this is an important set of things to think about and think about how we're conversing with teachers more than ever and how we're supporting them more than ever. Um, because I have so much empathy for all of my teachers right now, right? Like they're not just teaching virtually or teaching two groups of kids at once. They all have kids at home. I mean, what, 92% of my teachers have kids at home too. And so they're trying to handle their own kids' education and the pandemic. And that's this incredible amount of social emotional stress that we've never had in education before. And so this one walks you through a couple different things to think about when you're conversing with teachers. And there's a couple of really amazing quotes. One of the quotes that really sort of stuck out to me because one of the biggest things that I've changed this year is my discourse with teachers. Um, and the quote is, I loathe positivity that serves to cover up things that suck. Give me honesty, give me transparency. Recognizing that this year sucks and is full of wrong answers will not break the specific bad news to anyone, but we may as well acknowledge it where we are so that we can address it. Uh, my discourse has changed this year with teachers markedly. I have always been the person that's like useful on a team for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons is my like relentless positivity and commitment to the vision. And this year, being positive when I walk in a room, especially for a small group meeting or one-on-one -on -one meeting with the teacher, isn't always helpful. All they're hearing is positivity. Um, and so I think this year, it's a lot more of me coming into the room, checking in with them socially and emotionally more than anything else. And sometimes just having an honest and frank conversation with them. You know, it's changed a lot. And it's also, I will say, strengthened a lot of my relationship with my teachers because when everyone is being so positive, you're doing great, you're doing awesome, you're killing it, keep up the good work, keep up this. They need more than ever someone to come in and be like, this sucks. How can I help you mitigate the suck? How can I help you do better in this situation? They need a little bit of honesty and it'll go a long way for them in the long haul. Additionally, when we're talking about transparency and the way we speak to teachers, I thought that this was a really, really interesting quote that I'm honestly very guilty of. I'm a big thank you person, right? Especially when I communicate with principals and district admin and teachers all in a day, right? I might communicate with people from every part of the district in a day. And the idea of saying thank you is something I always try to do but I had never thought of it the way that he puts it in his article. And he says, thank you for all that you do reads too often to me as I have no idea what you do. Alternatively being recognized for specific work I've put in cool things I was a part of or impacts I've made is really energizing and good. And I know as someone who communicates with that many people in a day, this puts us in a, between a really big rock and a hard place. Okay. Um, because as administrators, you're communicating with people and you want to thank them. But I really do think a big change that I've tried and like I've got post-its up on my desk <laughs> is trying to be specific. If I'm going to compliment someone, I try to be specific. Like, hey, I was in your room today. I saw that hyperdoc that you were doing on character traits and it was really awesome. I loved when you had the students respond in this way. And that's going to reinforce the good thing that they're doing and also give them positive reinforcement that's not just generic because we're so overwhelmed with generic positive reinforcement right now. So I hope that that was helpful. Um, it was just a very overview overview of all the different things that we've done wrong and failed forward on this year and what we're going to be doing in the next years to come, especially next year, which is crazy to think that we're already planning for that, even though we don't exactly know what it's going to look like. Um, but thank you so much for your time. And you can always get in contact with me at techforyall at gmail.com or on my website or on Twitter. It's probably the easiest place.
Well, that was awesome. Awesome. And it's, it's a little emotional for me, <laughs> you know, we've been talking to so many um, leaders from schools across the nation since last March, since the day that Doug and I flew into Philadelphia. And as we were in the air, we were seeing a cascading loss of all of our attendance for the next day. And we, we literally just had our staff email everybody and go, you know, we're not even going to be there tomorrow ourselves. So don't come. And we managed to get on a flight and come back home. I didn't get to go to my favorite Philadelphia restaurant, but, um, you know, ever since then, it's been kind of a mad scramble um, to, you know, coalesce all these energies from all these leading thinkers nationally and put them out there as Learning Council of News Media and Research. And, you know, our big national research, Samantha, you, you, you've heard me talk about this. Um, it, it was a monumental shift from 2019 to 2020, what happened. And um, so we're really interested in this whole discussion about the, this side of it, you know, the, you know, look and see what's really happening with people because, you know, we, we as a species seem to get out of bed in the morning and get dressed at all because other people are gonna see us, you know? <laughs> And so, so if we're never going to see other people. Like uh, it kind of kills the whole vibe. So, yeah, um, I want to see happen what you're talking about. Like, let's not be so focused on academics only that we miss the point of it all. Um, you know, there's a point to the social emotional side that is it's huge. And, and we're not going to go back to normal. Everyone says that now. We're not, the normal's not coming back, but what is the future really look like? And so when we talk about hybrid logistics today, I, I think we've nailed it, um, where it's going. So hopefully you, you'll come back for that or stay on. Um, I want to make sure I'm going to check and see if anybody else wants to chat, chat you up right now. Um, anyone want to raise your hand and let us know that you're on and say something and... Uh, I know we've had a lot of people chat, but if there, is there anybody who wants to be unmuted, we'll like grab you and throw you on and, and have you make your comment right now. Okay, I don't see anybody making comments, but I know, I know people feel really the same way as you because I'm hearing it all over the country, um, Samantha, and I'm glad that you've evolved to this particular viewpoint. There are some schools still where it's like the leadership is is just trying to drive achievement. They're getting pressure from the state and they're like, gotta get this done. And they're just laying waste, you know, to a lot of the humanity. Teachers are leaving in droves. We know this particularly as Learning Council because 75,000 of our readership has turned over in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a massive retirement shift. There's all new people. The people we knew before, we, we, we call them again for the events. We're like, so now you're the superintendent, you know, like every year we, like, you keep moving, you know, it's like the people yeah. we knew before were like the CAOs or the head of instructional technology. And now they're like, well, I'm the superintendent now because everybody left. Um, yep. It's, it's a wild time. Um, proud of you for thinking this way and, and observing the obvious, you know, it is mm -hmm. obvious. Young children spend 75% of their school day involved in listening activities and need to receive 90 to 100% of information via the spoken word to understand the full meaning. But there are numerous barriers standing in the way of that critical intelligibility. And unfortunately, they can't get fill in the blanks when things are missed. In students' environments, distance, directionality, and ambient noise all play a role. Speech gets quieter over distance, dropping in volume significantly as it makes its way toward the back of the room. Further, when teachers face away from their students, the sound level can be cut in half. Distracting ambient noise can also drown out speech, leaving students and teachers straining to effectively communicate. And simply increasing the volume of speech itself is often not enough. As loudness increases and teachers try to reach the entire room, students might be able to hear what's being said, but they may still struggle to understand it. For example, clarity is critical to the understanding of soft consonants, such as p, t, k, s, and more. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has added additional challenges to the listening environment 
such as greater distance between students and teachers, masks and other facial coverings, and protective barriers on desks. With instructional audio, you can overcome these challenges. By leveraging a microphone with either a portable or installed speaker solution, you can ensure the teacher's voice achieves even coverage, regardless of distance, directionality, and ambient noise. And with an easy, tap-to-talk microphone, student voices are clearly heard by both their teachers and peers. Instructional audio provides a clear way to hear the human voice and a pathway to elevating the learning and understanding of students in the modern classroom. To learn more, contact Lightspeed today.